Hi guys, welcome to the Chelsea Skidmore Show. I am here by myself recording an episode. I haven't posted anything in a couple of weeks. To be honest, I just, I don't know, I just wasn't inspired to. And I'm kind of learning in this quarantine that it's okay if I don't feel like doing something, if I feel uninspired. I'm really trying to take everything one day at a time. Um, so podcasts have been part of that and I just wanted to do a quick little check-in and um, just kind of go over like what my experience has been like during this time and some stuff that I've been working on and doing. Um, but first I uh, created a Instagram Q&A, um, just questions for my solo uh, episode. So I want to go through some of those and I just want to give a quick shout out the painting behind me is done by one of my best friends, Allie Rose. She is a great artist. Um, I'll pull up the, if you're listening on Zoom, you can't see it, but if you're watching on YouTube, um, you can see the painting behind me. Um, I love it. She's very talented. It's so funny because she is, um, she's a very, very talented artist and she doesn't even like work that much. She doesn't put that much energy and work into her work on like a daily basis. But when she does sit down and paint, she creates incredible paintings. Portia de Rossi, um, Ellen DeGeneres' wife, and Portia is also an actress. She uh, came across Allie's paintings on her Instagram or someone from her team did. And um, Portia curates all of the art for Restoration Hardware. And she had Allie paint all these paintings. This is one of them. I have an actual painting, but they're prints sold at Restoration Hardware. Uh, she's had like gallery shows, people contact her, you know, wanting to buy her paintings for thousands of dollars. And it's so funny because uh, like when she decides to, she can just create like amazing paintings and make tons of money. And it's just like so interesting to me. Um, I don't know. I love her. She's she's a good friend of mine. I have four beverages in front of me. I have a lemon LaCroix, LaCroix or LaCroix, we're not sure. I have an iced oat milk latte. I have a cup of peppermint tea for bloating because I just ate sesame peanut noodles that I made and I'm extremely bloated from it. And I have a cup of flat water. So I'm just kind of working with my beverages, um, relaxing a little. I'm in a dress for the first time in quarantine, which um, to be honest, I have been bumming it in sweatpants, oversized t-shirts, shorts, pajamas. Um, I don't know how many weeks this has been going on. Let's see. If it is April 30th, that means this has probably been going on since like, April, or no, no, not April, fuck. April, May, March. This has been going on since March. So almost like two months, I wanna say. A month and a half. I mean, like the time is flying by, but it's not, but it is. It's weird because the date, like thinking back, like, oh, it doesn't seem like we've been in quarantine that long, but then the days like completely fly by, but I've been bumming it. And, um, and I was fine with that and like comfortable, but, I started doing my friend Stacia's workout classes, which I will talk about in a little bit, and um, just trying to take care of myself more and um, eating healthier, And uh, but I'm still having fun with recipes and cooking too. But the real reason why I'm wearing a dress today and even lipstick is because my husband, Steven, has lost 23 pounds on um, a diet that is like a diet that his sister does. If you want to know more about the diet, send him a DM uh, at Stephen Randolph too on Instagram. But he lost 23 pounds. He got a haircut and he dresses in normal clothes every single day, not in pajamas. And like, he looks hot as fuck. I felt like uncomfortable yesterday. Like literally I was like, do I deserve to be around you right now? Like, like, like I felt like charity as his wife and we were like making a joke that I was like hugging him like a fan and he was like, oh, like they're there. Like, so I was like, I need to fucking step my game up. So I'm waiting for him to come home and notice. Um, but anyway, so let's get into the Instagram Q and A. Um, the first question that I got was, do you believe in aliens? Um, my husband and my dad both love aliens. A lot of guys love aliens. Uh, 
but do I believe in them? I'm not like a part of the alien subculture. I know a lot of guys are super into watching alien shows and documentaries and YouTube videos and all of that. Um, if I think about anything in the sci-fi horror category, um, I could start believing it. Like if I see a scary movie of something under a bed, it's gonna be hard for me to sleep that night. So if I saw something about aliens, I would trip myself out. But like, I don't typically think about aliens or um, I'm really trying to like connect with how I really feel about that question. Um, ultimately, yeah, I believe in them. I guess I believe in them, but like, I don't like think about them enough to like have a further opinion. Like I believe in them, but like, whatever, you know? Um, that wasn't really a good answer. Yeah, I believe in them. Okay, I'm a stripper. Here's the next one. I'm a stripper and I've struggled to transition out of it. How did you move on from stripping? So when I was 20 to 23 years old, I was a stripper when I was in college. I started in Hawaii and I worked at Roxa there. And then in New York, I worked at New York Dolls, Scores, and Penthouse. And, you know, the, the real reason why I stopped doing it is because I started dating a guy. Well, first of all, I always, I was just doing it while I was in college. So I was cr coming up on graduating my senior year at 23 because I transferred schools a bunch of times. So I was actually in college for six years instead of four because I transferred three times or twice rather. I went to three schools and um, because I transferred so much, I lost credits and I think I already said that. So anyways, um, so I kind of had this like idea in my head that I wasn't gonna strip outside of college. It was cute still while you were in college because you could be like, I'm stripping through college. But like, if you're a stripper outside of college, like you're just a stripper. Like you're, it's not even cute anymore. So, yeah. So I had that in my head that I didn't want to be a stripper outside of college. The second thing was I started dating a guy around this time. And I really, really liked him. And um, he was sober. He was attractive. I wasn't sober at the time. But ultimately, he was my Eskimo, which is like a term that people use for people who kind of influence or bring you to AA um, or 12-step programs to get sober. So I was dating this guy and he basically said, I really like you, but I don't want to date a stripper. And that was enough to influence me to, he made me want to be better, but I really, you know, I think you should try to find a reason for yourself to wanting to be a better person. I don't think, you know, we should look to the opposite sex or, uh, you know, other people to want to get better for ourselves. I think that it, like any self-improvement should really come through ourselves. It's like the most rewarding that way. But, um, you know, so I just stopped then. And then I ended up getting a job working in production instead and just tried my hand at like a normal job. Um, but, you know, that being said, it's something a friend of mine told me was, I was like, you know, I just want to do it for like three more months. And I kept putting this like timeline on it in my head. I just want to keep going for three more months. And then my friend said, three months is going to turn into three years real quick. And that scared me. And I think you could apply that idea to anything. Like, I'm just going to keep drinking for three more months. And it's kind of just like, when we put these like time limits for bad behaviors, it, 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 we always keep pushing it. So it's like, just quit cold turkey and stop. <sighs> what else? you know, might help you is like, I don't know what you do for, I don't know if you have like another dream job in mind, you know, um, or like a goal, but, uh, it's really hard to, when we're participating in these negative bad behaviors for ourselves that, um, are really harping on our self-worth and our self-esteem, it could be hard to accomplish other goals. So I think that once you get rid of all the behaviors ultimately and have that willingness and trust in something greater than yourself, that's going to take care of you and have faith that, you know, at first it's not going to be easy. Um, there's going to be a lot of financial insecurity. Um, but ultimately 
you will be given a gift of a second chance at life, a new beginning. I mean, I really think like, I didn't realize when I was stripping how much it was affecting my self-worth and self-esteem. And you think like, oh, I'm in control. I'm just having fun. I'm making money. Like I got this, like there's a lot of cockiness and confidence there. And then once you stop and you reflect back on it, I'm personally um, experiencing a lot of shame and guilt for a lot of my past behaviors, um, you know, including with stripping and, you know, the stuff with Harvey Weinstein and a lot of my past experiences that I just don't feel good about today, especially in sobriety. So I am working on that right now in um, therapy, which I will also get into. But, you know, if you do want to get out of stripping, you can. It really just starts with you and your choice to do it. And then you just have to trust that something better is going to come along and, you know, pray about it and just put one foot in front of the other and it's going to get easier. And I really wish you um, a happy and healthy and um, exciting transition out of it. And, you know, the great thing about sex workers is that they're very motivated people. I would say the same for alcoholics who are getting sober is that you're going to find a way to get money anyway. So that hustler mentality that you might have had as a drug dealer, as a stripper, as an escort, is going to be transferred to the new job that you do. So you'll realize that you're likely, you know, you're probably not a lazy person. You're probably a very motivated person. And now that you can't rely on men to make money, you'll just start relying on other ways and you'll find that you'll probably attract in a lot of money. So it's going to be a really positive experience if you just give it a chance. Another question, tell us more about your days in NYC. Um, I'm from New York, I lived there my whole life. When I look back at my days in New York City, the biggest thing that comes up for me is partying. Um, I was, you know, a party girl. Um, I grew up in Westchester outside of the city, which is like 40 minutes outside, but my dad lived in New York City. So, you know, I started having parties at his apartment when I was 16 and um, started going out when I was 16 or took the train to the city when I was 15 to do ecstasy at the Roxy, which is a club that used to be there. And uh, it's so funny. I remember I snuck out of the house that night and my dad didn't even notice. And I came home and he was still passed out. And it was like, I can't believe I got away with that. Um... But yeah, I just think about like partying. Um, I started going out when I was 16 and um, I was really super into like New York nightlife, which um, is kind of like that rock and roll celebrity, socialite, stylish, fabulous nightlife scene. Um, like I went to all the best clubs. I, you know, I, I partied with, you know, a lot of celebrities and famous people and promoters and, um, and it was just like crazy. And, uh, I went out every single night. I dated this one guy when I was in college who was a party promoter and our schedule was we would wake up at 10 PM, go out all night long, do Coke until 10 AM and then sleep from 10 AM to 10 PM. And that was my schedule for three months straight. And it was insane. We'd take Xanax to fall asleep, like two bars each, and then wake up and start going to like a bar and partying and then go out to clubs. And it, it was just such a crazy time. I was in summer school that year and I was in an astronomy class and I got called on to read and I forgot how to read. And it really, really scared me. For some reason, my brain just like couldn't put the words together because of how much coke I was doing at that time. So yeah, when I think about my days in NYC, it's just really partying, but it's also just like fashion. It's fun. Like a lot of my close friends were there, you know, in the summers when Soho House opened in New York and it used to be very cool. Um, you know, I would lay on the, uh, my dad was a member. So we would, you know, I'd lay on the rooftop and I'd invite my friends and like, we'd lay out all day and like drink and then we'd go out to clubs. Um, my absolute favorite club was Beatrice Inn. Now it's a restaurant, doesn't exist as a club anymore. Kenmar, Electric Room, Avenue, uh, LeBaron, but those places don't even, 
I don't think they like even exist anymore. I don't go out anymore. So I don't know. It was just like good times, but I look back on it and it's like, it was fun because I was partying, but I think I don't like uh, my New York life now is redefined um, because I am sober. I am in my thirties. I don't like going out anymore. So now it's more like, um, when I go back and I visit, um, you know, I'll just go out to dinner with friends and walk around and, you know, like the last time I was in New York, me and Steven, we got a boat in Central Park and we like rode around in there. Well, he did while I relaxed and um, that was like really fun. So it's kind of just like still having a good time in New York, but just doing it in like a more adult way, I guess you would say. Um, Someone wrote, how do people pay rent? Uh, fuck, that's my alarm going off for me to take my meds. Um, I started upping my anxiety medication, which I will mention in a little bit after I get through these questions. Okay, um, how do people pay rent? I don't know, get a job, Jake. Um, okay, what was your rock bottom that helped you to become sober? Basically, cocaine is what got me sober. I was doing so much cocaine that I really couldn't even handle it anymore physically. Um, I started going to the hospital a lot and they would be lowering my heart rate with IVs filled with Ativan. I was wearing an EKG heart monitor around um, at one point, having like my heart measured, my heart rate, because it was like damaging me so much. I was really, you know, the hangovers are really, really bad. I felt like I was dying. I felt like I just like had nothing to live for. And I had, you know, big dreams. Like I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to do stand up. I had all these things that I wanted to do. And I just knew that I couldn't live the life that I wanted to live. I always felt like I was meant for something higher. I meant, I thought that I was meant for something bigger and my life was really small, you know, like it, it was really just consisted of sleeping all day, hung over, wanting to die, eating like, you know, like greasy takeout food. And then at night going out to clubs and doing Coke and having like meaningless conversations and with like strangers and stuff and then never talking to them again. And, um, it was fun until it wasn't fun anymore. And I'm grateful that I stopped at 26 and I went into AA and I, um, I relapsed a couple times in the beginning, but ultimately, you know, it just wasn't working for me anymore. It wasn't fun. It didn't make me feel good. And my hangovers were too bad. And, you know, I just had a lot of dreams of things I wanted to do. And it's completely impossible for me to accomplish anything if I'm not sober. Like I can't accomplish any work. I'm like not the kind of person, I wasn't like a high, um, a high bottom person, which means like I wasn't able to work like a nine to five crazy job and like do all these things. And then people were like, oh, she was an alcoholic. Like, no, my life was partying and that's it. And like, that's all I'm capable of doing when I drink. So, you know, if you want a better life, get sober. What's your definition of ultimate success in your industry? Fame, money, arenas, TV. Um, my definition of success in my industry. So ultimately my goals in this industry or you know, the roles that I'd like to have are writer, actor, director, stand up. Success in the industry to me is like getting paid well to do what I love to do. I think that's what success feels like. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to, I'm trying to like really sit with it. You know, it's like easy to give an answer like seeing a movie I wrote on a billboard or, you know, selling a TV show, seeing that deadline article, um, you know, uh, having a trailer to be the star of a show, having a special, like all those things are like obvious answers, but they don't feel like my answers. I think it's just kind of, 
you know, I really just want to sell TV shows and movies and um, winning awards, being on billboards, all that kind of stuff is stuff that I don't know that it would really mean as much when it happened. It's like we all want that kind of recognition, but I think like hearing people wanting my like people wanting to actually like pay for what I'm creating, I think kind of feels like success for me. Um, so that's just my answer. Uh, do you remember meeting a time traveler in Hawaii that looks like me? No. Next question. Are you originally from Massachusetts? No, I'm from New York. You fucking idiot. Two. Talk about how I met Joey Diaz. I don't know if you meant by how I met Joey Diaz, but, um, I met him working at the comedy store. Uh, and yeah, you know, I worked the door at the comedy store. He's a comic who performs there. I've gone up in front of him a couple of times. We've talked and he just started letting me open for him and doing his podcast. And I love Joey so much. Um, he's been incredible to me and he's like a really great, um, person to just kind of learn from. Um, I'm really grateful that I know him. Any recommendations for a person wanting to give comedy a shot? You know, I get this kind of question a lot and I feel like people are always looking for an easy answer. And the only answer is that you have to write and get on stage. That's it. Write, get on stage. Um, there's really nothing else you can do. And, you know, obviously be somewhere where comedy is going on. I mean, they have open mics everywhere, but New York and LA are really like the big places. And then of course there's scenes in other areas, you know, Denver, um, Portland, Atlanta, They're, they have comedy everywhere, but te uh, like uh, in Texas, there's like smaller scenes and stuff. So I don't know, some people say start somewhere smaller, but I just started in LA and it's been fine for me. So, um, you know, just start writing, get on stage. There's not really much more to it. Next question, have you ever ran into an ex randomly in public? If so, how did it go? I had this really awkward experience where, you know, when I moved to LA, I was dating a guy who didn't want to commit to me. This is the guy who got me sober. He and I, um, we didn't end on bad terms. I ended up moving to LA. We had hung out a couple of times while I still like lived here in the beginning. And then we stopped talking for a while and I got married and I moved on and we didn't really talk. I actually had sex. I actually had gotten out of a breakup from someone else and I called him when I was in New York and I had sex with him. And then a year later he moved to LA and he was dating this super famous comic girl. And I saw him and her at a meeting and First of all, I heard that they were dating. So I texted him and I said, oh my God, I can't believe you're dating, blah, blah, blah. She's like one of my favorite comedians. And he didn't write back. And I was like, oh, that's so weird because there was no issues between us. I was really shocked why he wouldn't respond to me. And then literally like less than a week later, I saw him at a meeting and he just looked at me and didn't say hi and walked away with her. And I was so hurt, I was so shocked. Like it just really hurt my feelings. Um, it was just really fucking weird. Like, why are you ignoring me? So that's what happened then. And we just never spoke again. And like, literally no idea why he blew me off. They're not together anymore. But like, I don't know. It was just weird. Like, I didn't even do anything. Why are you ignoring me? Okay. Favorite memory as a stripper. Um, I don't really have a favorite memory, to be honest. But like a funny memory is... For some reason, okay, so there's a lot of regulars that come in, which are customers who, um, you know, really like you and they want to keep coming and see you. Some of them come every day, multiple times a week. This one guy came who really liked me. And like a lot of these guys like thought that we had like deeper relationships than we did. Like they think that you guys are actually like dating or that you have something going on, but you really don't. Um, <laughs> and he was like, I got you a present. And it was, he like hands it to me, like really excited. And it was this like, no joke, like triple XL multicolored rainbow wool turtleneck 
from Macy's and it was so fucking ugly. And, um, but I didn't like show that because, you know, I thought it was really sweet that he got me something. I just didn't want to make him feel bad. So I was like, oh my God, thank you. And then I just like gave it to someone. Um, so yeah, I don't really have any favorite memories, but that's like a funny memory that comes up to me. Like, why are you giving me this like really ugly sweater? <laughs> um, okay. Next question. How has comedy affected your life positively and possibly negatively? Hopefully not at all. How's comedy affected my life? Comedy has affected my sleep schedule, I'd say. Um, you know, uh, working at the comedy store, um, my, my schedule is my shift is from 8 to 2 a.m. So it's affected my sleep um, because, you know, I go to sleep a lot later. My sleep hours when I work at the comedy store are... Um, like sleeping from 2 a.m. to 2.30 a.m. to 10 or 11. In quarantine, I'm waking up at nine and I'm going to sleep at midnight. And I really like the earlier hours a lot better. Um, so that's negatively. Also negatively, it's, um, it's kind of easier to come up with the negative ones first. <laughs> Um, negatively, it, um, makes me get into compare and despair where I compare myself to other people. Like, why did she get that? Why did he get that? Um, it, it's very competitive. It can make you feel bad about yourself watching what your peers are accomplishing. And if you're not there yet, or if you get overlooked for something or like, you know, I'll show up to the comedy store sometimes and all of these, like door guys are getting to showcase for something and I wasn't asked to showcase. And I'm like, what the fuck? I've worked there for seven years. Like, why is that person showcasing and I'm not? Stuff like that. Like, it's very, very competitive. And I got to be honest, in quarantine, I have not missed that. Um, the competitiveness is the thing that is the hardest for me. It makes, it really brings me back to like childhood. It makes me feel um, less than. It makes me feel like I'm on the outside watching everyone play in here. But, you know, the positive parts of it are that it, um, it feels incredible. I mean, like the thing that I missed during quarantine is when I think about stand up is just that moment of waiting right before they call your name and you're going out to like a sold out show and you can just kind of see like the big crowd from like the sides and the lights. And like, that's a very exciting feeling and just like waiting for them to call your name and like going out there and like, you know, uh, I really have like my best shows on the road when I'm opening for Bobby Lee or Joey Diaz and like their crowds are incredible. I love doing crowd work with people and just like having more time to just mess around and like discovering new things. And, um, and just like, I've had a lot of times where I've started laughing so hard. I've started almost crying and just like, I love being connected and in sync with the crowd and, um, feeling like we're finding and discovering things together. We're all in on the same jokes. That's super fun. I really love that connection with the crowd and it feels very powerful to be on the stage with the microphone and to be the one who is dishing everything out. And if someone tries to heckle you and you put them down, like you feel like the shit and um, it just feels really good for your ego. So that's kind of just the balance. Um, you know, it's really important to stay in your own lane in comedy and not look at what other people are doing and just, you know, look right in front of you. It could be hard though. It could be hard. And I have a hard time with it. And I think some people don't. And I just want to be honest and say that I do. And I wish that I didn't. I wish I was so cool. I didn't care about what anyone was doing, but, um, I don't know. I hope I grow out of it, but that's, that's that. Next question. Do you believe in the notion live comedy entertainment will not return for at least a year? I haven't really thought about it. I'm not subscribing to any of these like timeline quarantine things. So I'm just going to keep it moving. Um, but to be honest, I, it's hard to imagine like the comedy store or any other comedy club opening up. But I think, um, will happen will eventually they will open up but the spaces are going to be much smaller it's probably going to look more like a distanced jazz club sort of setup where it's like if the room normally had 100 tables they might have 50 tables spread out 
Um, I can see that kind of happening um, and just having like a lot more space and less people, um, you know, which could mean more shows for comics, um, you know, to make that sales money. But yeah, I think it will eventually open up when, I don't know, but um, I can't wait until it does. Okay, so I think those were all the questions. Oh wait, there's a couple more. Um, have you already recorded any comedy sets that might be licensed by Netflix or Amazon? I have not. And do you have any recorded comedy sets that might be turned into an audio album? I haven't recorded an audio album. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, thank you guys for the Instagram questions. I love answering them. And now I just want to check in about a couple of other things. I made myself some bulletproof, not bulletproof, bullet point. Um, stuff that I just want to talk about my experience during quarantine and how everything has been going. Um, I'd say the biggest thing was, okay, so this whole thing has been going on like a month and a half, I think. Um, I haven't even fucking noticed or like noticed the day that it started. But, um, the biggest thing that I have worked on is acceptance, 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 acceptance about what is going on about what my day is going to look like, about what the outside world is going on. You know, I can only control what's in my hula hoop, which is like a recovery term. That means if you put a hula hoop around yourself, what's inside the hula hoop, like close to your body, is the only thing that you can control. I can't control the comedy store opening back up. I can't control whether this person we sent my fucking pilot to is gonna read it or not. I can't control my manager communicating with someone else's manager about a pilot that I wrote. I can't control the fact that people might not be reading scripts during quarantine. I can't control the fact that I haven't gotten any auditions and some of my other friends have. I can't control that my husband um, is moody and I'm thinking it's about me. I can't control that it's raining outside today and I can't go on my daily walk. I can't control, uh, you know, the fact that we ran out of lemons, I want to make fucking lemonade. You, you get the picture. So I have to be in acceptance. And this brings me back to the 12 steps. The first step is, you know, is, uh, you know, that we wanted to stop drinking. We admitted that we we're powerless over alcohol and that our lives have become unmanageable. And it's kind of about being an acceptance. So I'm admitting that I'm powerless. I cannot control. I am powerless over the situation, the coronavirus, what's going on, um, the quarantine, the government, everything. I'm powerless over that. It makes my life unmanageable to try to control it. So now I'm going to go through these, you know, I'm going to be an acceptance of what's going on and just do what I can do. I don't know if I explained that right. Um, but, you know, it's the notion of one day at a time. I'm taking everything one day at a time. I'd say for the first two weeks of, two or three weeks of the quarantine situation was very hard for me. I was not in acceptance. I was in a lot of fear. There was a lot of roller coasters of emotions. I'm sure a lot of people experience that and might be still experiencing that. I feel like right now I have come out the other side, but um, I had massive anxiety. I lost my sense of smell and taste for six days. And 50 people a day would tell me that I had coronavirus. And it really, really tripped me out. And it made me really anxious. And for a week straight, I had intense panic attacks. And it was really, really hard. And it was really freaking me out. And I had to go to my psychiatrist. And he upped my medication. But... I actually didn't like the way it felt. So I just went back to my normal amount and it went away. But I just try to, you know, monitor myself. And some ways that I have lessened my anxiety are by creating boundaries with myself and with other people. So a boundary with other people is this. When, you know, now everyone's like pretty chill about Corona stuff, but at first, I'm sure that we all have the friends who, we were all sending each other like a thousand fucking emails a day about what's going on, text messages, links, blah, blah, blah. So the boundaries I set with other people is I would start saying, hey, I'm not reading any articles right now. Please stop sending them to me. 
And the reason why, and the boundaries with myself is I would stop reading the articles. And I noticed that when I was reading all these articles, it was making me really anxious. And I think that everybody, you know, has a different opinion on this. My opinion is I understand wanting to be informed, but unless there's a really big thing going on that I need to know about, which I kind of don't think there is, my whole idea of kind of what's going on is that you wash your hands, you wear a mask, you keep distance from people, and you're just careful in general around other people and where you are and, you know, being sanitary and sanitizing everything. That's all I can do. There's nothing else I can do. I can't control people dying in hospitals. I can't stop the virus from, you know, where it's going to fucking land, but I can wash my hands and wear a mask and protect myself. And I don't feel like any news article I read is going to be helpful to me. I think a lot of people want to be informed and I think that's great. And if that makes you feel better, then do it. But for me, it doesn't. So, you know, the boundary with myself is I'm not going to, if someone sends me an article anyways, when I told them I don't want one, I'm not going to click on it. Like I just don't read them and it just makes me feel so much better. I'm going to have a sip of my fourth beverage now. It just makes me feel, I just spit, sorry. It makes me feel so much better to not be like tripping myself out. So that's just like what I don't do. Another thing that has helped me with my anxiety is my kind of self-care routine that I've set up for myself. It's, um, I'm like the type of person who really loves structure. So in normal life, before quarantine, I would be having to-do lists that I would be checking off. I would be like, you know, really into accomplishing like a certain amount of things. I, um, you know, and the stuff that I like to accomplish in a day is I like to write. I like to meditate. I like to journal. I like to hit an AA meeting, an Al-Anon meeting. I like to work out. I like to do self-care, clean, um, that's like the stuff that keeps me, uh, keeps me sane. So I, you know, once I kind of got past the whole fuck we're in a quarantine thing in acceptance a couple weeks in, I was able to get back to like my normal life. And, you know, yes, I can't go to like stores and I can't see all my friends and I can't, you know, go to Sunset Tower and have lobster tacos on the terrace with Sarah Weinshank, which is one of our favorite things to do. Um, you know, I, I can do what I can do. So that includes taking workout Zoom classes. A couple of my friends are teaching workout Zoom classes. Leah Lamar teaches a great Pilates class three days a week. Stacia Patwell teaches um, a great booty workout class Monday through Friday. And um, who else has? Those are the two that I know of. Um, but I love taking workout Zoom classes. I get to see my friends. I get to get in better shape. And I'm really getting in a lot better shape now than I was before quarantine. So these workout Zoom classes have been changing my fucking life. And it's just one hour. It's one hour of your fucking day. And, you know, otherwise I also do like YouTube yoga stretching videos or, um, my other friend McKenna teaches workout classes too on Zoom. They're really easy to find. They're all donation based. Um, so it's not like you're paying $30 a class. You know, you can film on them five, 10 bucks and get to work out and feel great. So Zoom classes. Second thing is walks. I love taking walks. Um, I'd like to get a daily walk in. That's like an hour, an hour and a half. You know, I've done two hours if I'm really bored and Getting outside, getting sunshine, um, moving my body feels incredible, and it's kind of like a non-negotiable for me. I listen to podcasts, I make phone calls, I complain about my husband on the phone, I, you know, get inspired. I, I listen to like a number of podcasts. I listen to um, Dak Armchair Expert, which is Dak Shepard's podcast. I listen to Mark Maron's What the Fuck podcast. I listen to Oprah Super Soul Sundays. I um, will listen to, um, let me look. Let me look at which ones I like. I listen, oh, I listen to um, Script Notes, John August and Craig Mason's podcast, which is one of my favorite podcasts talking about screenwriting. Um, I sometimes listen to the 
uh, the real, uh, true Hollywood, what is that thing called? True Hollywood, uh, the Hollywood Reporter, <laughs> THR, uh, Awards Chatter Podcast, that's on here, Off Camera with Sam Jones, I sometimes listen to that, The Adult Chair with Michelle Chalafant, I sometimes listen to that, um, I started listening to The Moment with Brian Kopelman. Sometimes I listen to Tim Ferriss's podcast. It, I really just switch it up. I subscribe to them all. And then I see um, what guests they had on and what they're talking about. And then I pick a podcast and I go on my walk. And I'll call my mom and I'll call Madison. Um, Madison is my best guy friend. He uh, was living in New York City and currently moved to a farm in Maryland and now he is going to start a chicken business in Maryland. He was an event photographer in New York and, um, he, you know, wanted to get out of the city and now he's like really enjoying his life, taking care of all these baby chickens and he's going to start selling chickens. So I check in with him. He married me. He is one of my best friends. He, um, is my rock through emotional stuff and if I need a laugh, and I love to check in with him. Um, so that's that. Uh, meditation is another one. I do the Calm app on my phone, it's 10 minutes a day. I now don't have any excuse for not having time for meditation. You know, meditation for me was one of those things that I would like to be like, oh, I'd love to do it, I don't always have time. Now I like to just lay in bed when I wake up after I pee and do my 10 minute meditation. And then I ice roll my face with an ice roller that I keep in the freezer. I have my coffee and then I like to journal. And um, I do the morning pages, which is I take a, no a notebook. Take a notebook, I write three pages in the notebook every single day. Um, I'm not good about doing it every single day. I like to do it every single day if I can, but um, you basically just journal like whatever you wanna journal about and stuff just comes. There's so much that's in your subconscious that you don't realize about. And it's like incredible. For example, I love writing. Writing is what I want to do more than anything. I, you know, have written a bunch of TV shows um, that are, you know, out right now, not on TV, but that are, that are being sent out right now. And, you know, I hope someone wants to buy one um, because that's, you know, that's what I want to do ultimately more than stand up, more than anything is I want to be a writer. Um, so, I love writing and um, during this quarantine, I have been putting a lot of pressure on myself with writing because for the first couple weeks of the quarantine, it was really hard for me to feel focused. I felt extremely like unmotivated, uninspired, unfocused. Um, you know, a lot of us were kind of disrupted with fear and worry about what was going on. It was really hard to just kind of focus when you're thinking about what's going on in the outside world. You know, a lot of us were going through kind of traumatic feelings with everything. And um, so it was really just hard for me to just sit down and chill out. And every day I would be journaling. I want to write so bad. I want to write so bad. I have nothing to write about. And one day I just started writing this list of fears. Um, I have no good ideas. No one's gonna wanna make anything I write. I'm not actually a good writer. What if everyone told me I was a good writer my whole life and I wasn't? Nothing good ever happens for me. You know, all these like negative, I have to plug my laptop in. Um, all these like negative fears and thoughts and things that weren't really true. And I knew that they weren't true, but I did them anyway. I mean, but I wrote them out anyways. And then I looked at it and I was like, wow, I didn't realize I was carrying all of that around. You know, I wanted to write so desperately, but I had no idea I was filling my mind with all this negativity. So what I did was I read that fears list to Steven and I kind of tried to like release it. You know, we lit a candle, I talked about it, I breathed out the negative energy. And then ever since then, I started writing a new script and it just kind of came together. And, um, you know, with writing or with anything you want to do, it's really just about showing up. And once I really, I started noticing also, I kept talking about how much I wanted to start a new writing project. And then I wasn't sitting down and writing. It was just like all up here in my head. And 
I listened to a podcast that was basically saying like, you have to put your ass where your heart is. So if you want to write, you need to sit in front of your computer and write. If you want to paint, you need to sit in front of the easel. But we can talk about all these things. We can think about all of these things. But until we sit down and we do them, we're not going to accomplish them. And I was like, damn, that's right. I need to stop thinking about and talking about how I want to write. And I need to sit down and write. And I just started writing a new idea and started showing up to it every single day. And now I'm like 40 pages into a new script and I'm really excited about it. And it's really just staying accountable to yourself and being an acceptance and giving yourself um, space to really not know. Cause I, I don't know where everything is going in the script. It's kind of like a half idea that I'm developing and finding as I go. And, um, and my new therapist has been talking about the idea of living in a question mark um, and being curious. So I don't have to know all the answers to things that I want to accomplish, but I can take steps and I can be curious and I can kind of just like live in the mystery and have fun with that. Cause I used to not be able to just like live in the mystery and not know what was going on. And you know, I want to know, I'm going to be doing this and that's going to be that. And this goes here and that goes that. And that's perfectionism. And that could be paralyzing to creativity. So if you just let yourself loose and figure it out as you go and not put the pressure on yourself and it's just going to be fun and we'll see where this goes. It's so much easier to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. So I suggest kind of looking at things that way if you're having a hard time. I'm out of breath. Um, Let's see, let's see, let's see. Movies, um, been watching movies every single night, new movies. I finally saw Apocalypse Now, I loved it. We watched the documentary Heart of Darkness. I finally saw Blazing Saddles, which was so incredible. Um, last night we watched Somewhere, Sofia Coppola's movie that I never saw. Uh, we're just kind of getting the chance to watch a bunch of things I've never seen. Um, watched Primal Fear the other night. So me and Steven, every night we watch a movie and he picks one and then I pick one and we rotate and it's been really fun. <sighs> Cooking has been an incredible creative outlet for me. Um, I love cooking. I love looking up recipes. Steven just got home. Hi, baby. Hi, baby. I love um, cooking and looking up recipes. It's so fun for me to just play around and like look up things and like type in ingredients that I have at home and then you can just see like what creates uh, like a recipe and you know uh, and, or just like finding recipes um, of things I want to make and then going uh, to the market and getting those like ingredients. Cooking is super easy. It's just science. You just have to follow a recipe. It's not that fucking hard. Um, I started experimenting a little bit more. I you know I was cooking a lot of the same stuff at first, like scallops, asparagus, you know, pasta. Um, I started venturing into meatballs, chicken cutlets. You know, I cook a lot of Italian food because I'm from New York and that's like the cuisine that I grew up on. But I started cooking um, more Asian and Thai stuff now. So I um, last night made like homemade uh, Thai peanut noodles. I, um, I made a uh, green curry with like lots of fresh ingredients. Um, the other night I, you know, I'm going to make eggplant Parmesan. I just like really love exploring recipes, trying new things. Um, I made this like Southwest corn with all these spices that I'm adding into like Mexican dishes. So just, I don't know, cooking brings me like a lot of joy. And I have these like really nice plates that I got as a wedding gift that were kept in a box and I took them out and I started using them and I was like why was I holding on to these why am I like I better enjoy my home space now so we started like bringing out more candles it's like how can you make the space you're in incredible I got like a tablecloth with lemons on it because I miss Italy I love the Mediterranean um you know I love Positano so I want to get this tablecloth for our kitchen table that made me feel like I was in Italy, you know, because it's the summer and we're not there. So why not bring Italy to here? I put this, this, if you're watching the video, I put two lemons in a jar. I mean, it's kind of like ridiculous, but 
it just made it feel like fun and colorful. And like, I'm just kind of finding little like DIY things I can do around the apartment to make it feel fun. Um, and yeah, um, I started doing uh, therapy with a new therapist. We do Zoom meetings every, uh, Zoom sessions every week. And it's been so incredible to work with her. Um, I've probably only had four or five sessions with her so far, so far but she's amazing. Um, she's very intelligent. She's stunningly gorgeous. And um, she's really, really good. And what we're working on right now is me just feeling my feelings and sitting in them. So I'll tell her, you know, about fucked up things that happened to me when I was growing up. And then she'll be like, whoa, 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 stop. Can you sit in that for a second? How does that feel? Where do you feel that in your body? I'm so sorry that happened to you. What does that feel like? And just getting connected with like emotions. She really wants me to feel okay with crying because I'm really uncomfortable crying in front of other people. And, um, she's helping me to feel okay with being seen and vulnerable. And I'm really excited for the work that we're doing together. So, um, I've been doing therapy. If you guys are doing therapy, I hope you're continuing on Zoom. I'm doing couples therapy actually with Steven in half an hour. Um, we've done a couple couples therapy sessions because we've been fighting a lot. And you know, it's not hard being quarantined. I mean, it is hard being quarantined in a one bedroom apartment with one other person. Um, it's been really difficult, uh, but we're doing a lot better now. And I feel like it's kind of like moving in a wave, you know, there's like hard days and then there's, you know, easier days. And I'd say the days are more easier than not right now. Um, but it's kind of just learning to give each other space and listen to each other. You know, I didn't realize that how much men needed space. Um, and I didn't realize like when men come home from work, or when they're busy working, they don't want you to talk to them. And, you know, when he's unwinding on his phone after being busy all day, it has nothing to do with me. He's not ignoring me. He needs to take space for himself. And once I really started to get awareness around giving him space, uh, I started noticing, like, you know, it, it, things just got better. Like, I, I think I was being needy during the first half of the quarantine because I felt very lonely. I felt like I didn't have anything going on and he was really busy working and I felt very shut out and ignored. And I was probably, you know, because of that, like we got into like a push pull where I was being very needy and then he was pushing me away. So we've been working on that. And, um, my friend Stacia told me to get this book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. I've only read three chapters so far, but it just talks about the differences of men and women and how men need space and how they need to go into their man cave and like reflect and women need to talk out their shit with people. Um, and I've just been trying to, you know, really like pick and choose like what I need to bring to him and what I can bring to a friend and giving him the space he needs and like recognizing when he needs space and that he has his own shit going on that has nothing to do with me. Um, we've had a couple of date nights. He did this like really cute thing for me where he ordered takeout Japanese and he brought our kitchen table in front of the TV and set it up like a drive-in movie theater. And we watched TV and like he had everything set up and it was really super cute. And just like finding these like really fun, cute little things we can do together has been making everything like really great. And like right now, you know, he's in the bedroom and I'm in the living room and we'll work on like, who's going to have the living room to work. Who's going to work in the bedroom. He got a desk, um, just kind of like figuring out our spaces and like watching our puppy and like, you know, asking for like what we need. Like he'll be like out and about doing stuff and I'll be like, Hey, I really want to go on a walk. Can you come home? I want to like go outside for an hour. And like, so just kind of like communicating, being open, listening, understanding. <sighs> I am out of breath. Um, that's pretty much it. And then we got this puppy Jaggy. His name is Jagger. He's a bulldog. He just had his 
second to last round of shots today. Um, unfortunately, because of parvo, which is some kind of disease that like kills puppies, um, he can't go outside until he has all of his vaccines. So in three weeks, um, he gets his last round of vaccines and then we can start taking him on walks. But he just goes outside on our balcony right now on like pee pads and hangs out out there. And I'm so grateful that we have a balcony that like gives him space. But yeah, I mean, like it's really fun to have a puppy, but like he is so crazy. Like he pees and shits inside. <laughs> like on the carpet sometimes and it's disgusting we'll probably have to throw it out um you know he'll bite a lot but um besides all that stuff he's so sweet and it just brings so much love into our lives and I'm like oh my god I didn't realize like like I didn't like know I could love like a little puppy so much and um he just brings, yeah, so much joy and love. And like, we love cuddling with him at night and watching TV and he's so sweet. And like, he's so excited to see us in the morning when he wakes up and we love him so much. So he was definitely like the best gift of the quarantine. Um, so with that, thank you guys so much for listening. I think I am done. I covered my check-in and what I've been up to during the quarantine and the stuff I've been going through. Thank you guys so much for listening. I will be back with a guest following this episode. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review. Let me know if you liked it and what you thought about the episode. And I hope you are all staying safe, healthy, and inspired. So have a great day. Thank you guys. Bye.